Right, okay then. Good morning and or afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this service for the third Sunday of Lent. Um, whether you're watching us in real time or at another time, welcome. Um, I'd just like to let you know that I'm now currently self-isolating at home. Um, I'm very happy to receive phone calls or emails, but obviously I will not I should not be meeting you in person, but um, uh, that hopefully that's it. that situation will change at some point, but not yet. We will be broadcasting another service for Mothering Sunday, which is Sunday the 14th of March at the same time. So we begin with a prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the colleague of the day. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, 
and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Reading today is from Exodus 20. It's the Ten Commandments. Um, I'm not at it's Exodus 20 verses 1 to 17. Um, it's quite a long reading and I suggest you read it at your leisure. Um, however, for people who are worried about the Ten Commandments, I've got a very simple thing to say. Um, you don't actually have to know them off by heart. The important thing is to stick to the basic principles. And this Jesus' summary of the law was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength and mind, and your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So really Jesus was giving us a summary, which means even if you can't go to commandments, if you stick to those principles that Jesus reminds us and quotes from the Old Testament, you will find that you are observing the law. I'm now going to move straight to reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the same? God made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'm going to read from John chapter 2. The interesting thing about this episode is that in John it takes place right at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. In the other three Gospels it takes place during what we now the week leading up to the crucifixion. The Passover, of the, the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it said, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. They then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. 
after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. I'm now going to say a few words. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Quite a few years ago, not long before I went to theological college, I was, for a few months, at between jobs, as they say. I was redundant from BT and had yet to start college. So I looked for work and ended up at Canterbury Cathedral in the visits department. My job title was Shepherd. Lots of us were student types and the job was poorly paid and a bit ad hoc, but interesting and sometimes a good laugh. One of the issues at the time was the bringing in of an admission charge for visitors. Then, as now, this provokes argument. I felt, as I still do, that it was wrong to charge, as I believe a cathedral is so much more than a mere tourist attraction. And yet, they need the money to survive. I know that. I also know how much it costs to keep our churches, all of them, in good repair. But of course, commodifying places of worship is nothing new. Perhaps some of us reflect on Jesus' actions in the temple in Jerusalem, about which we hear in today's Gospel reading, when we are confronted by a high admission charge at one of our cathedrals. Back to Jesus' time. Contemporary accounts tell us that at the Feast of Passover, that is the big event in the Jewish year, the population of Jerusalem increased from its normal around 50,000 to nearer 180,000, a massive increase. And for some, a huge commercial opportunity. There were pilgrims who had come to celebrate the Passover and Roman soldiers drafted in to keep the peace. On the occasion of Jesus' visit, there would have been hustle and bustle in the temple precincts, particularly the court of the Gentiles, not, of just, not just of humanity, but of birds and animals with accompanying noise, nests and smells. There were money changers too, converting everyday money into the temple currency that was required on site. And dove sellers, to provide a cheap alternative to animal sacrifice for those who couldn't afford sheep or cattle. Doubtless, there were sw swindlers and fraudsters there. Plenty of opportunity for that. For the traders, all of them had a living to make and must have felt seriously aggrieved when Jesus went for them, cracking his makeshift whip and overturning the tables. I don't know if it was anything in particular which provoked Jesus' actions or whether it was just the fact that it was happening. It was certainly not his first visit. He was not a priest so he wouldn't have been allowed into the inner sanctuary but would, like many Jews, have seen it as an important spiritual home. Maybe he remembered his visit there when he was twelve causing consternation and panic to his parents when he stayed behind discussing things with the learned people there. But on being found, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Any or all of these things may have been on Jesus' mind when he arrived at the temple that day. What is more certain is that he saw something that touched a nerve, provoked him, and made him see red. 
The Jews asked Jesus to explain himself. His answer made no sense to them. To them, talking of destroying and raising the temple in three days was provocative nonsense, impossible and blasphemous too. It also left the disciples completely mystified. And in later, after Jesus' resurrection, that the penny, or denarius, finally dropped. Jesus had been speaking of the temple of his body being raised up after three days. So on one level, these words were a direct prediction of his death and resurrection. And it is telling, indeed, that not so many years after Jesus said them, these words, the temple was indeed destroyed, never to be rebuilt. This event totally altered the nature of Jewish worship. Jesus also speaks of his body, which he sees as his followers, the church, us. And like any body, it can become defiled. We can worship God with our lips. We can observe the rituals that insult him by the way we live our lives. Perhaps that is what Jesus saw in the temple. Some of the activity going on there was an affront to God. This would be consistent with what we know about Jesus. Throughout his ministry, he spoke out against hypocrisy. And people who appeared to be living a holy lifestyle, but were corrupt on the inside. The scribes and Pharisees came in for particular criticism on this count. So, what is the message for us today in the Gospel? Perhaps, a consist perhaps consistent with the theme of Lent, we need to look at ourselves, individually and as churches, to take stock whether our lives are free from hypocrisy and insincerity. Are we open and sincere in our religious and everyday life? Or do we keep up a pretense of being holier than thou, when in fact we're not? Jesus welcomed sinners and spent time with them rather than the scribes and Pharisees, in whom he detected a fair amount of hypocrisy and, of course, failures. Perhaps we need to admit that we often fall short Pharisees, in whom he detected they were okay spiritually but were blind to their own failures otherwise Jesus can do they can move to a better relationship with God and their neighbour We have put ourselves beyond the saving grace and forgiveness of our Lord, and our faith is a a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your world, holy places. Through them, may we learn awe and respect for your good creation. I are all leaders of worship to work with your faithful people in the ways of holiness. Done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for all we live. Guide all who influence the minds of others, for teachers. We pray for all dealing with world, world trade, commerce or in 
and will to use wisely what you have given to them. Lord, your will be done on earth. Thanks for all who have shared with us a sense of wonder. And be willing to help others simply live. Lord, we ask that all who are homeless and those who work with them earth as it is in heaven. We pray for all who are captured. Remember those who suffer through the selfishness of others. Be a strength to all who are this. We pray for all who have lost their livelihoods during this most difficult time of pandemic or in pain at this time. And for those working in caring for To our current health crisis. Lord, your will be done on earth. We give thanks for all who have faithfully obeyed your will, for all who have worshipped you in the beauty. That we may share with them in your eternal kingdom. Connell and Dick Fletcher. Lord, your will be done. And we rejoice in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin and all your saints and commend ourselves in love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son. Amen. And now we say together, Art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power. Amen. And goes to a close. I like, hope you all have a good week and that you will continue. the blessing. Merciful Lord, the world, the flesh and the devil, and with pure heart, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, Take up your cross and follow him and the blessing of God Almighty and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all whom you love and for whom and forevermore. Amen.